is a confusing place. This is the kind of story I hear often. My cousin worked out all the time. He never drank or smoked. He ate a ton of healthy food, including things like uh, kale and tofu and quinoa. He dropped dead at 50. My uncle never exercised. He smoked like a chimney, drank all the time, ate a ton of burgers all the time with fries, and sometimes would stick the fries in, those, in his burgers. He's still going strong at 94. Conclusion, why bother taking care of your health? It doesn't really make much of a difference. Here's another example. They told me that we would get huge flooding where I lived. So we evacuated. It's a pain in the neck. We evacuated. Floods missed us by five miles. I'm never listening to a scientist again. These sound like reasonable conclusions and common sense. Statistical thinking can help you actually figure out that some things that sound commonsensical aren't actually as reasonable as you might think. So here, here, here are two examples. One example is just look at the outcome. That's, that's not a good idea because that completely ignores the enormous role that chance has to play in any given outcome. Okay. Another thing that people say often is it's simple. Just look at the data. The data speak for themselves. Not true. Data never speak for themselves. Data need interpreters. Okay. So if you're coming back to the first two examples at the beginning, you can actually really take care of your health, but that only improves the probability that you will be healthy. Individual circumstances and chance have a huge role to play in the actual outcome. The second example, the fact that scientists can predict hurricanes to within a few miles of where you live is, is amazing. And maybe 25% of, uh, of the time in that case, that home would have been hit by the hurricane. So that was actually the sensible choice, right? You can't just look at the outcome. Uh, just because your house didn't burn down last year doesn't mean that you were silly to get insurance. It's, it, it's, it's, it makes sense if you think about it that way. Take two of the great challenges facing our world today, climate change and infectious diseases. It turns out that statistical thinking can actually help you think through some of the issues there too. Okay. So I'm going to start by, by using uh, an example from climate change, something that I've actually worked on in my own research. I've worked as a, as a statistics professor. I've collaborated for over a decade in both climate science as well as infectious diseases. From climate science, one question that people might ask is, how high should we build levees in order to protect our town particularly if you're worried about sea level rise due to, due to climate change, in order to answer a question like that, you would need to understand something about what is going to happen to the Antarctic ice sheet in a few decades, right? The Antarctic ice sheet, this massive hunk of ice down by the South Pole, uh, if, it, if some of it melts, that can actually raise sea levels around the world. So this seems like a daunting task to try to figure out what the Antarctic ice sheet is going to do a few decades from now. And it is, it is a daunting task. And um, I'm reminded actually of a trip I made to Congress several years ago uh, to talk to people about climate science. And a very smart congressional staffer, very well dressed, sort of sat back here and, and, and looked at me and said, you know, professor, he didn't say professor like that, but, but it was implied. He said, if you can't get the weather right in five days, how could you possibly make a prediction about the ice sheet in 50 years? Right. Really good question, really smart question. Hard to answer, so I said, let's talk about baseball. So if your favorite batter is going to go on play and play tomorrow, and I asked you to predict what he was going to score, <laughs> 
tomorrow, you'd be a gambler, right? Even if you knew this guy very well, you'd, you'd be a gambler. It's very hard to predict any given day. But if I asked you next year, next season, which is way off into the future, to predict what his average would be for the season, you'd probably get a pretty decent idea of what that might be. You might say 280 to 300, something like that. And you'd probably be right. So long-term, slow-moving things that are averages are inherently less uncertain, whereas particular things that happen on a particular day are more uncertain. And so the analogy here is that predicting what the batter does tomorrow is like trying to predict the weather in a few days and trying to say something about clim the climate in a few decades, slow-moving, slow-changing, that actually is a lot like trying to predict the season average for a batter. Okay. Now, this is still a very hard problem, trying to figure out what, what the ice sheet is going to do in a few decades. So how do scientists do things like this? Well, for this, you need models. So what's a model? A model is a simplification of reality. So something like this, this toy set is kind of a model. It's not a very good model. It's a fun model. This is a model of an ice sheet. It's a sort of a cartoon version to give you a sense of, of how one thinks through modeling. So if you see this big blob of white on the right-hand side, think of that's your ice sheet. And you see the, the, the red arrows from above, that's precipitation. That, that's the snow that's coming down, and then when it starts to, 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 to come down over a period of time, that's what actually forms the ice sheet, keeps growing it. And then some of that ice sheet, you see the curves that are coming down, those, those, uh, that, those describe how the ice flows from high altitudes to lower altitudes and come up against the ocean waters, which are warmer, and the warmer ocean waters will melt some of that ice, and occasionally a piece of that will break off. That's a process known as calving, and uh, it'll break off into an iceberg that floats away. Uh, there's a lot more going on there. The ice sheet actually f uh, kind of slides a little bit on the ocean floor, the brown stuff at the bottom. There's a ton of other things going on, but there's actually a lot of physics that's very well understood to describe how the ice sheet changes over time. Now, the, the physics describes a lot of that, so, you, so it's described in the form of mathematical equations that show how the ice sheet is evolving. You need data because you know a lot of the physics, but you may not know some of the details. You know, how quickly is this thing going to calve, so break off and float away? For that, you observe the ice sheet over many years, and so you've got physics, You've got data, and then, if you're a careful scientist, you always say, well, it's, this is how we think it's going to break off, give or take this amount. That give or take, that's the uncertainty piece, and that's what gets us into the statistic, statistical aspect of this. So the model has the physics, data, uncertainty. You put all of that together, now you can actually use this, this ice sheet model that I just described, and you can kind of run it forward and see what kind of sea level rise, what kind of melt you see from this, and hence what kind of sea level rise you might expect, but again, give or take some amount with uncertainties. Okay, so I talked to you about climate change. It turns out a lot, a lot of the ideas that I just described to you now also apply to infectious diseases. And we're all mostly masked up. Uh, and we're, we've got infectious diseases on our minds constantly now. So you can think of what some of the big questions with infectious diseases might be. You know, how many people are actually sick? How many people are dying of that disease? Those are hard questions. Uh, you have data out there, but you can't actually answer all of those things just by looking at the data. You have to do a lot more. You need to understand the data, and you need to have models to figure things out. Plus, you also need, in addition, to see the impact of certain interventions, like vaccinations, for, for example. Um, and all of this requires the same kind of thinking. Models, data, and then uncertainty quantification. Okay, so let me give you an example. This is, this is, this is a picture uh, of something from a paper that, that one of my long-term collaborators, Professor Matt Ferrari, who's also a professor here at Penn State, uh, we've worked on measles uh, in the past. This is some paper that he's written with some other colleagues. This is, if you're curious, it's also on the, on the CDC website now. And if you see, there are two curves, 
One is solid and one is dashed. The solid curve tells you what the number of measles deaths would be if no one were vaccinated. Okay, so that didn't actually happen, and so you have to use the data that you have and the models that you have to try to figure out what it would have been if no one were vaccinated. And then the dashed curve is what happens if people are vaccinated. And by looking at those two curves, you can kind of see what vaccination actually gives you. It's actually a very complicated process to figure out what vaccination buys for you. Um, so you need models, lots of people thinking through the science, and then you need data. And so if you focus, for example, on the year 2001, which is highlighted here, the number for the case where there was no vaccination is about 1.75 million. That's the best guess from the solid curve. And then for the dashed curve, it's around 1.1 million, right? And then you notice that there are bars on either side. Those are telling you the uncertainty. So you don't really think that you know it's exactly 1.75. You think it's somewhere between maybe 1.4 and 2.1 million. Huge range. And similarly, you might say it's something like between 0.75 and 1.5 for the cases where people are vaccinated, right? So with those uncertainties, so big uncertainty bars, now you look at the two trajectories, they're quite different. In particular, you see that there's a steady increase with, with not, without vaccinations, and there's a dramatic decrease. So if, you, if there are vaccinations. So that difference tells you some impact, something about the impact of vaccinations. Okay, so even with uncertainties, you learn something great there. All right, so where does this all leave us? Well, first, the chance has a role to play in our day-to-day -day lives, as well as in understanding, for example, two of the great challenges of our times, climate change and infectious diseases. Second, data can actually inform us about these challenges, but data do not speak for themselves. Data need interpreters, they need models, and the best models are those that are built by people who understand the science, understand the data, and think carefully about uncertainty. As an aside, people who think models are wrong and hence still come up with their own predictions and their own decision making are still using models. They're probably just not telling you what that model is and it's possible that their models don't in involve science or data. Okay. Third, uncertainty is uh, not the same as not knowing. You it's just a way of acknowledging what you know and what you don't know. And even if you're uncertain, you can still make informed decisions. And finally, statistical models and data are never, or almost never perfect, but they're extremely helpful for us to try to make some sense of this very complicated world we live in. Thank you.